joining our pa panel today about the wonderful world of wildlife and conservation. My name is Lottie, Millie Group host and producer, and I'll be moderating this panel and chatting to you all today. So for those of you who are tuning into Millie for the first time, Millie is a company dedicated to building a global community for international students, which is why we host these panels and webinars every weekend. If you're interested in any future events that we host, follow us on Instagram at Millie underscore group for updates. So here is how today's panel is going to look. We do have some pre-prepared questions ready, but we really encourage you guys to use the Q&A box here on Zoom to ask our panellists any questions that you might have. And whether they're general or more specific to a panellist, I really encourage you to make the most of this time because I'm sure that they're more than willing to help you throughout this hour with any questions that you you may have. So let me introduce our amazing panellists, Sam, Sasha and Fifi, and we may have Kate joining at a later stage as well, all of which are going to be sharing their individual wisdom and experiences of life in wildlife and conservation. So please can we kick off with each of your names, the city you are currently in and where you are from, what you are or you were studying, and one fun fact about yourself. So my name is Sam Shores. I am a current graduate student at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. I'm studying marine biology, and I also work for uh, a film company in town called Boot Scrap, which is a sustainable film production company. Um, and one fun fact about me is that I am about to release a almost full length documentary about Hurricane Florence um, and its interconnected uh, effects when in our area as well as the state that I live in. Can we hear me? <laughs> um, I'm Sasha. Um, I'm in the UK in Lincolnshire at the moment. Um, my family's from London. Uh, I graduated Harper Adams University last June um, with a degree in wildlife conservation and environmental management. Um, I've forgotten what the rest of the question was. <laughs> What's a fun fact about me? Um, I did a lot of traveling when uh, before I went to university because I didn't want to go. Um, <laughs> and uh, probably my favorite place to go was Mongolia because there were no people and lots of wildlife. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Fifi. Uh, I am a journalist based in Jakarta, Indonesia. So I've been an environmental journalist since 2008. Um, what else? Uh, basically my major is philosophy. <laughs> so it's kind of like weird, but I've been dealing with environmental uh, issues, related issues uh, or articles uh, here in, uh, in Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm cur currently working with China Dialogue as their Southeast Asia editor. So managing stories, environmental stories like waste management, infrastructure, uh, also wildlife uh, from the Southeast Asia region, especially Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia. Um, fun fact about me is like um, when I'm not doing all the journalism stuff, I used to binge on uh, K-dramas, Korean dramas, and K-pop and stuff like that. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I know the fun fact part is quite difficult, so I appreciate you sharing those. And thank you for letting us have a bit of insight into who you are and what you do as well. So we're going to kick off with what each of you personally define a wildlife and conservation role, because obviously it's such a broad sector and there's lots of different things you can get involved with. But also, what does it mean to you and where did your initial kind of interest come from as well? So for me, um, conservation is an interesting word because oftentimes we think of protecting different habitats around here, but conservation can also extend to a, a broader reach of protecting really any natural and recreational resource that we have and how we can best use it, not just for ourselves, but to make sure that those resources are protected and utilized efficiently so that they are here for future generations. That could be anything from saving a longleaf pine forest or barrier island to even conserving the sand that's used, uh, that we use to nourish our beaches. It may be the materials that are around and thinking of it, maybe not just as something that simply exists here now, but something that is to be used 
and hopefully used with, in harmony and in tandem in the future. So conservation for me um, is preserving places, species, and also the habitats that they live in. Um, in the UK, we're actually one of the most, we're the worst at preserving our own natural places. Um, <laughs> we have a terrible record of it. So um, it, for me, conserving where I currently live and where I'm from is so important as, because we are sort of fallen on the back burner in terms of the rest of the planet because people don't see the British wildlife or, or wild places as particularly spectacular compared to somewhere like Africa with the Great Plains and the Great Herds. But when you actually live in it and you work in it, you see how amazing we like where the British Isles are in terms of diversity. So losing that would be awful. So that's why I got into it. Well, in my part as a journalist, uh, it's more like a journalism uh, scope or, or, or landscape. It's about uh, how do you make sure these articles or the stories about wildlife and conservations is, you know, reach it out reach out to much more wider audience especially because wildlife and conservation in my own experience are not really actually that sexy kind of style uh, kind of articles or, or uh, a theme compared to climate change or compared to like for instance like illegal uh, logging here in Indonesia so I think that's um making sure that you use and utilize uh, journalism to kind of like put on spotlight on wildlife and conservation uh, issues that have been mentioned by the other panelists. And uh, for me, I think it's kind of like a personal um, uh, achievement actually to write about wildlife conservation because this hasn't been really uh, been uh, told before. And you can have like many angles to it for wildlife and conservation and um, you know and for me as a journalist it's kind of like really uh, fresh angles that was really actually aimed for when you're becoming a journalist that's for me thank you guys for sharing that i think kate um just joined momentarily but maybe she's she's headed off again um but thank you very much for sharing each of your experiences and I guess also geographically you know we're talking lots of different places here which is fantastic as well we're getting a really good scope of what's happening across the world so wildlife and conservation careers involve as you guys said protecting and conserving wildlife their habitats managing and monitoring populations but also talking a bit about sustainability as well can you some of as concise as you can how you got to where you are today and we always say this with whatever kind of sector we're talking about but everyone has a unique journey and we're quite interested in how each of you got to where you and what your roles are today Absolutely. My my journey was a bit interesting. So as, as many people know, the United States has a terrible track record uh, with waste. And so that's where I initially started. And it came from when I was 16. I worked at a McDonald's, unfortunately, and I needed a job to pay my bills. And I saw the tremendous amount of waste that came from one restaurant, one business every single day as I worked there as a 16-year-old. Um, toward my early undergraduate career. And it put into perspective how poorly we manage resources, how much we build into a cycle really of purchasing goods that we don't necessarily need or poorly used, poorly sourced. And I couldn't possibly think of how is this good for anybody? There's, it didn't feel like a win situation for anything. And it opened my eyes to this perspective of waste. And so I really started getting into plastics as I went into my undergraduate career. I was on, on the coast of North Carolina on our eastern seaboard on the Atlantic, and I saw firsthand how this affected uh, the environment. I saw a lot of waste in our gyres, in our sargassum algae, which is a critical habitat area for a lot of juvenile species, and started to understand that what we do on a daily basis here in the States was going into what was then my backyard in the Atlantic Ocean. And it made me kind of understand that one, we do have an impact even at an individual level. Um, and two, that these systems were a lot bigger than I could initially comprehend. It was going to something as large as one of the biggest oceans and areas for recreational resources, fishing and things like that. 
and seeing how it was affecting not just the current day, but those future generations and seeing a lot of our sea turtles literally entangled with this waste. And so that was that was my jump into conservation, realizing that we had a problem with waste. We had a problem with how we were using resources, how we were sourcing resources. And this was going far beyond what I could initially comprehend where I first grew up and where I first started. So um, my sort of journey into sort of conservation and love of wildlife and natural places began when I was very young. I've always loved being outside. Um, cruel, I was always the sort of child that would run away and climb a tree, much to my mother's uh, horror. Um, so when I started going to school and thinking about it, I was like, I want to do when I get into secondary school and you start thinking about a career. For me, I just wanted to be somewhere outside. My worst nightmare is sitting at a desk. I hate doing it. Um, obviously, some part of my job, I do have to sit at a desk, but um, luckily it's only a small proportion of it. Um, so once I was at university, I'd chosen my degree, wildlife conservation. You think of that as the broad topic and most of what you hear in the news is the fluffy side of conservation which I call it, which is the sort of like your pandas and your tigers and all these amazing, beautiful animals. And then you have, I don't want to call it the darker side, but it's the less fluffy side, which involves machinery and um, controlling species. A great example being Australia. Um, dog, wild feral dogs running around Australia. The only way to deal with them is to destroy them humanely. I mean, there's no, nothing else. Well, it's like there's a, there's a gritty hard side to conservation that needs to be spoken about and it isn't spoken about and it's the same in the UK we have outrageously exploding deer populations that need controlling and there's no natural predators left in the UK to deal with that so practically working on an estate in the UK helped me realize that this needs to be brought out into light and it needs to be seen as not this horror that people do see it as but as something that's really important in we've disrupted the balance as a species so it's our job to put it back and a lot of putting it back is not what people like to hear <laughs> so um that's why I decided to go into the career I do because it's a practical approach to it. it so I like the practical work base well for me I think it's more of a, a an assignment because I was um when I got my first journalism job uh, at the Jakarta Globe at that moment, uh, they kind of like uh, tasked me to, you know, responsible with the environmental issues. So I think that's, that's before that, I have no idea about wildlife conservation roles because I was major in philosophy. So it's kind of like very new to me. So, but the, the, the interesting part is once I got to the job once I got this task and responsibility of you know putting out articles every day and it's kind of like really um, makes you kind of like a bias to the conservation world and the wildlife uh, because Indonesia has like really a lot of flagship uh, endangered species like orangutans, tigers, uh, rhinoceros, um, that's for the big mammals and also uh, a lot of uh, the none heard before, like the trees and everything that I haven't really actually explored. So that's kind of like the journey for me, uh, one article per article. And then, you know, uh, started off from like the big issues with forestry issues. And then you got for forest fires and after forest fires and you got another uh, issues like, oh, what about the orangutans there that's been uh, threatened with forest fires and illegal logging? And also uh, talking about illegal hunting, illegal wildlife trafficking. And then you, you kind of like, after that, you got uh, in encounter with like a bird species that's been endangered and then illegally sold. So that's kind of like the nuance when I got into the um, the reporting of environmental and then, and then kind of like uh, actually kind of like learning about this wildlife and conservation um, issues and also about the monitoring system here uh, and sustainability and all of those jargons. Uh, I think that's kind of like my journey actually from professional into something that's kind of like a now I kind of like a dedicate my 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 articles for for uh, for the issues. Yeah, it seems like all of you had 
a lot of personal inspiration there you know seeing something that you wanted to engage with some type of activism to fix an issue that you could see happening in the world um and that's really great I guess as well obviously with school we talk about academia but the fact that you all have physically gone out and engaged in something um whether that's writing about it with you Fifi whether it's doing practical work like you said Sasha and also obviously Sam I think your example about McDonald's is an amazing example of seeing such a huge brand wasting so much um how that's inspired you to go into into actually a role in it I think going back to school obviously we do talk about books a lot and about teaching did you find anything kind of training wise or placement sort of experience whether that was at university or maybe volunteering outside of school that really helped you I guess gain the roles that you have today as well because it's good to kind of have that real life experience outside of the institutions that we're in as well absolutely yeah um at at UNCW one of the biggest things is that we are in very close proximity to the coast and so we have a center for marine science where we have access to boats and research facilities just within 10 minutes of most people who house here. And one of the things that has been a great pleasure was that a lot of the courses that were offered at my university provided that outside experience and hands-on experience, whether that was actually working with various species, collecting them and assessing how different treatments in a lab could affect your community composition or how productive an organism was. Um, and so being able to take those courses, I was able to use that experience to actually decide what would give me the most hands on experience. And so I worked in several different labs outside of courses, too, where I was going outside. I was doing field technician work. And so a lot of my work has been based off of uh, oyster reefs, which is a crucial habitat for stabilizing our shorelines here and also provides a breadth of services for our fisheries and for filtering our water. And so I was able to get outside and actually do this hands on. And that was such an incremental part to what I wanted to do. And seeing it happen, I think, is the best way to learn. So much of it is based off of the conceptual matters when we talk about ecology and biology. But going and observing it was, to me, the best way to learn. And doing it hands on was a fantastic experience. And then on the other side, getting involved with other organizations, such as the World Wildlife Fund. I serve as uh, one of the ambassadors for World, World Wildlife Fund in the United States. And it gives us a way to actually engage with the policy side of things, not just seeing how we can use resources and conserve them, but what do we do at a state or national level to push for these things, to put that funding where it's needed in order to conserve the resources that we get to see on a regular basis and figuring out how that works either with other ambassadors and regions that are necessary, that may be having issues that I can't see in my state, or I may not be able to comprehend because I haven't experienced it before, um, or understanding how we can take the materials we learn at World Wildlife Fund and apply it to our local state and advocate to our representatives and to our state legislators in order to get the things done that we talk about when we talk about how urgent these issues are. And so that's kind of been the, the combination of factors that have allowed me to pick what courses I want, how to put that into experience, and then figuring out what do I do to actually make something happen, even if it doesn't necessarily feel like the biggest jump, it's still important to, to try and do those things. Um, so I was very lucky in a sense that the university I went to, Harper Adams, um, they give you a lot of practical experience in a lot of different fields um whatever course you're on whether it be agriculture or uh, wildlife conservation like I was on so uh throughout the four years I was there we did everything from small mammal trapping uh entomology studies uh, lab work on like energy levels in soil so you get a really broad range of experiences uh, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I loved every single one of them uh, doing soil sciences uh, almost destroyed me it melted my brain <laughs> but it did teach me the importance of how all aspects of conservation whether it interests you or not they all they're all interlinked it's like a food web they they all interact and you can't <laughs> One of my lecturers' favourite phrases is you can't save the tiger if you've chopped down the rainforest and you've poisoned the soil because you've nowhere to put said tiger when, <laughs> when you've destroyed its home. So it's all 
it's all really interlinked. Um, Harper Adams also has this fantastic system where all courses go on a year in industry um, as part of their degree. So uh, for me, that was my third year. And I actually was offered a, a volunteer role with the National Trust, who I'm now actually employed by, um, at an estate. Um, so I worked on an estate as a ranger uh, for a year. Um, and it was it that's what really gave me the sort of the leading light as to where I wanted to go with my career because I I thought about what I wanted to do whether I wanted to go back to Africa and do conservation over there or maybe go back to Asia do conservation there but when I worked and did conservation at home and on my home turf I realized how important it actually was that I, hang on a sec I can go to Africa and I don't know save a lion but what about where I'm from and the wildlife here? Like I said before, we're one of the most nature depleted places in Europe. Um, so I'd much rather save sort of like something as close to my heart as home um, as much as I love lions. But um, so, yeah, and that really gave me the sort of guiding light as to sort of, yeah, I want to stay at home, do conservation here. But the placement year with the trust when I was still at university gave me a massive leg up in terms of uh, support, information, uh, training um, and just getting out there and doing it was really important because you can read books about how to chop down a tree to save your life. But until you've actually done it, you need to actually have done that thing. So um you can't learn it all from books. Theory is one thing, but being able to physically do it as well is almost is more important in my terms anyway. Well, on my case as a journalist, I will well journalist doesn't have necessarily to do the all the the specific topics that they kind of like have to uh, cover. Even though there's a lot of my colleagues also uh, have masters in environmental sciences, environmental law, and such, but for me, I actually learning in the field, and um, uh, the best way for us journalists to do that is talking with and interviewing as much as possible, as much as a lot of pos people possible. Uh, you know, from the civil society, from the NGOs, uh, foundation uh, like WWF or Indonesia, we have Kahati Foundation. Uh, we have T TNC, we have um, the, Conservancy, the Conservancy Indonesia uh, and such, and a lot of uh, uh, in, um, foundations or civil societies that engage with wildlife and conservation and monitoring here also, like for instance, Indonesia. But uh, for like, if you, if anybody wanted interested in journalism, especially when you're talking about uh, environment journalism, you can also look out for like Earth Journalism Network. They kind of like offer you courses, uh, a very good courses that kind of like um, involve you with uh, environmental stories, not just like specific, uh, not just like environmental stories, climate change, but can also do wildlife stories like that. Um, and a lot of uh, now there are a lot of fellowships from the university also kind of like encouraging people to now uh, do more about environmental uh, related stories. So I can't go specific on the but there are a lot of now I, I, I kind of like uh, pay attention to the courses is now much more uh, compared to like 10 years ago. There's a lot of courses, a fellowship, especially for journalism uh to you know to grab on uh, if they really wanted to really uh, learn about this environmental uh issues especially wildlife and conservation thank you guys i think that's some really helpful advice about what you can engage with actually during your time either at school or through university about what sort of things you can try and involve yourself with to give you that better chance perhaps in a role that you have in the future um obviously i'm not saying that you regret what you chose to do at school or what subjects you chose to go through or even what university and course you did but if you could do anything differently or looking at the age group that's coming through now what advice would you give to sort of your younger self 
regarding studying and you know working towards the wildlife and conservation sector is there anything you know podcast related or anything that you're reading or any sort of things that you think could really really help anyone that's wanting to go into studying at a university for example or maybe doing a placement with something like the national trust um yeah what kind of advice would you give that younger self I think first I would tell my younger self, it's going to be all right. Um, these jobs are not necessarily around because they pay well. They're around because we're passionate about them. And there's a lot of applications for what you want to do. I initially wanted to study large whales, cetaceans, and see how it affects um, our climate. That may not necessarily be a very realistic job, though, for someone who is not a professional in that background or uh, didn't necessarily have that access. I had very limited um, experience with that sort of thing. Um, and I would tell myself that that's, that's okay. Um, there's other avenues that you can still be passionate about too. And that there's so many opportunities to be able to do something that you're still passionate about. And there's always a need in conservation to get stuff done. Um, we, well, that's a job that we'll always need. We will always need people who can try and preserve resources and can try and do these things. Um, and there's a lot of different routes that you could go down. So especially for state agencies, for example, we have the Division of Marine Fisheries in my state, we have a Coastal Federation, we have a Wildlife Federation, and a, a suite of policy related nonprofit and state agency organizations just in North Carolina. And I didn't know about these job boards until last year. And I didn't know that you could be a technician and work out there and have a salary job or that you could work for a reserve and actually be outside pretty consistently. And so I wish I'd told myself that there are those listings available. There are other ways to be involved, not just you don't have to go to just a nonprofit. You don't just have to go to university or you don't have to just go to the federal government. There are other routes to take. And I think finding those alternative routes or what we may not consider on a regular basis is one way to do it. And the other thing too is about when we talk about internships or apprenticeships. Um, I, in my undergraduate career, got rejected from nearly every internship or scholarship I ever applied to. And I was so beat up about it. I was so worried that I wasn't a good enough student. I didn't have the resume. There was something that I was missing. But that may not be the case every time. Um, there are fantastic people out there who are doing amazing things, far better than I could even depict right now. But I think I also needed to tell myself that you can also create your own route. You don't have to go the orthodox route of interning for that one prestigious scholarship or, or, or organization and that you can choose which way you go. Um, and I went toward the route of being outside, I get my hands dirty every single week. I can do things from uh, researching oysters and fisheries and some of our iconic fish here in North Carolina to working with things like stingrays or being just out on a boat and looking at the beautiful coastline that we do have. Um, and that wasn't something that I initially anticipated. And I think I would tell myself that um, your first plan may not actually happen, and that may just be the way that life goes, but there are avenues where you can still do things that you love. And I feel incredibly happy and lucky to be where I am, even if it's not necessarily the place that I'll be forever. It's a great way that I feel comfortable uh, with being uncomfortable. And I think that's about growth as any young person or any person looking in their careers to do that. Um, so I tell myself it's okay. It'll be all right. Um, that's quite a tough act to follow. <laughs> Sam said most of what I was going to say to you. Um, what I will say is never let anybody tell you, you you're not good enough or you can't do it. Um, sadly, speaking from experience, um, as a woman in my industry where it's quite physical and traditionally quite a male based industry, um, to be told, oh, you can't do that. You're just a girl. Like, um, no, you can't. Driving tractors is something men do. Picking up chainsaws is something men do. Never, ever let anybody tell you that because if you're determined and you have the passion, nobody can stop you I'm, I'm doing it now and I surprised myself um um in this in this industry I know I'm very capable of doing exactly what anybody else in my role could do um I will also say academics although important um they're not the be all end all 
I was crap at school. I didn't like school. Uh, I never got particularly good grades, but I'm still doing a job where I'm paid to do my passion. Like sometimes I walk around and I'm looking at trees and I'm inspecting trees for disease. And I look around and I look at this fantastic 800 year old oak tree and I go, I'm getting paid to look at that. Isn't that great? So, I mean, I get, I have a job that, yeah, I, I'm not in it for the money, um, but everyone needs money to live. I'm not being paid a fortune, but I'm getting paid to do something I love. And that to me is more important than the pound signs or the dollar signs. It's as long as you've got, keep your passion, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it and keep that determination, but also keep an open mind and every day you'll learn something new. You never stop learning in practical con conservation and be prepared for your arguments in your minds to be changed by a variety of different people because there's so many different views on how to, how to do practical and non-practical conservation. And every single person has a valid point. It just not, not, might not be what you personally agree with at the moment. Your mind will be changed a thousand times. So keep an open mind. Don't anybody tell you can't do it and just pursue your passion and you'll stay happy. I think everyone speaks <laughs> of very good advice. Uh, for me, I think um, um, maybe because I'm basically my major is uh, philosophy. So I don't really run into wildlife and conservation, not until uh, I work uh, as a journalist. So probably the, 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 the type of advice for me would be personally just don't overthink it. Because when I was uh, when I went to high school, everybody got stressed out about what they're going to do with their you know future, what kind of college they want to go. They have like kind of a, 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 a evaluation for the placement of the university you got, but I didn't really go into that uh, plan actually. So I just I actually wanted to go to psychology. But they kind of like rejected me and then I entered uh, philosophy, which is something that I've never, I never regretted uh, entering philosophy because it's kind of like open up my, you know, uh, broad uh, uh, thinking and, and uh, it got into a lot of studying. And I think that's what got me into uh, journalism and actually kind of like encounter with uh, wildlife and conservation uh, areas. The, the, because wildlife and conservation, uh, it's not something that's a really easy topic to understand. You know, it's a lot of broad issues. You have like a technical issue in there. You have politics issues there. A lot of things that this really layered. And um, what I learned from my uh, cho chosen one is like, you just don't overthink it uh just do what you think it's 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 good for you and what do you think that it's really like well, i agree with uh sam and sasha just what you're passionate about it's you, you it's your determination and and in something that you probably don't realize it at the moment because you're still young like you're still in high school but you actually, you know, you, you can, you, you are mature than that. And I, uh, I think people now, nowadays, uh, in high school, high schoolers now are more mature than my, my time actually 10 years ago. So uh, for me, don't overthink it. And second of all, just be nice and be kind to yourself if it's not working because like I wanted to go to psychology so bad when I felt it's like oh my god my whole world is like collapsing it's not it's even giving me the opportunities to go to the areas that I have never even imagined that I could go like you know from philosophy to go to journalism where journalism is bringing me to another world another occupation i've talked to like the the level of presidents official um the official senior officials of the governments to ngos to very vip to people on the on the roots on the, on the ground indigenous people and you you can talk to people like that so for me it's kind of like you know just be kind to yourself if you don't really actually made it to you point but you know you you can i actually kind of like going to find your way anyway you know just don't don't feel sad about if you don't really get through but you know uh it's going to be like it, everything is gonna be put into place itself that's for me 
Well, if that doesn't empower anyone on a Saturday, I don't know what does. Thank you so much for sharing all, all, all your advice on, you know, high school self, essentially. And now we're going to go into work, the world of work. We all kind of dread it slightly. But as you guys have all said, your pa- it can become your passion. And therefore, we kind of want to know a bit more about your job that you're in now, especially if some people have heard what you said at the beginning and are thinking, oh, that sounds a bit of me. I might go into that. So what does the sort of, I know for some of you, it's not always nine to five, you know, you're doing things outside of that as well. But what is your general sort of day to day? What are your responsibilities? What are your roles? And how would you sort of try and sell your role, I guess, to someone as well? So as a graduate student right now, um, the the work week is is all over the place. It can be pretty unpredictable, but most of my work is spent teaching or working in a laboratory. And so I primarily teach cellular biology um, to undergraduates. And so I do that for two classes each week. And then the other time is usually spent either managing things in our lab. So I am one of the graduate students at the Benthic Ecology Lab at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And that can range from anything like looking at um, taxonomy of benthic critters, which for many people, they don't care about worms or things like mussels and polychaetes and oysters, but that's what we look through. Um, And looking at how that community composition has changed. Uh, We may be doing anything by looking at percent organic material in different sediment types Um, here at the Cape Fear River, which is the North Carolina's largest river. um, It's also one of the country's most polluted rivers. And so there's a lot of different factors that go into researching those things. And then the other time is spent as a field technician or one of the supervisors for a variety of projects. So we're funded by both state agencies, the federal government and private grants. And so I manage uh, a partnership with the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries. And so what we look at is how juvenile habitats um, are being changed over time, as well as how different types of habitats may affect a juvenile recruitment of fish to those areas. Um, We also are looking at different areas with sand composition. It's what's called the frying pan shoals, which is a very shallow area at the mouth of the Cape Fear River, um, which is proposed to be used as both a wind farm in the state and uh, is being used to take that sand and re-nourish our beaches because we have terrible erosion. And so uh, that grant is funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management here in the States. And essentially what I'm brought on to do is operate small research vessels, bring field crews out to survey habitats, um, grab sediment samples, organize those things and bring them back to our Center for Marine Science where we process those and then spend most of the year looking through things like sediment, organic matter, uh, identifying different species. And so we may have other projects where we're building small created reefs of built out of oysters and other shell material to stabilize our shoreline, looking at those things. And so it's a variety of work. Um, it depends on what the flavor of the day is really depending on what I do. And so as a graduate student, that can be a lot of different topics. So day to day for me is quite hard to uh, lay out to you. Um, my work's very, very seasonal um, in this, depending on whether it's winter, summer. Um, uh, winter's probably easier because it's sort of, <laughs> um, so I'll go through each season sort of briefly. So um, as soon as we hit sort of September, October, uh, we have uh, the deer season comes in. So uh, the estate I work on, we have a very large herd of deer that has a 400 year old genetic pool that's been in that area for that long so uh, they've been fenced in for 400 years Um, so uh, the season starts and we begin reducing the herd numbers Um, uh, they also breed at that time so we leave the big breeding males to do their thing Um, and then um, we take out the smaller uh, sort of more genetically flawed animals as well uh, we it's all about balancing uh, the sex ratios male to female because you can't have too many of one and not enough of the other because otherwise the herd health plummets um, it's our herd is a very very healthy herd we have the healthiest uh, captive fallow herd it within the trust and I think probably within the UK as well they're a really lovely uh, thing to have and having them as part of my job is one of my favorite things uh, you might have guessed but deer is my big passion I really like deer 
and managing the species we have in the UK. Um, in winter, we also have the tree season. So uh, we start um, surveying uh, all the old or young or middling aged trees on the estate um, for safety flaws and also uh, checking them for sort of, uh, we start aging specimens and seeing what diseases and fungi they have. Um, if they're in close proximity to a, to a path and they have a fungus that we know is gonna end their life very, very quickly, that then becomes a dangerous tree. So we have to deal with that. Uh, we do all this in the winter because uh, there's less likely to be anything living in them. So we don't mindlessly go out and slice a tree up with a chainsaw. We do have to very carefully observe and survey a tree before we take it down. Um, and it's all in the name of safety because uh, in the UK, if a tree falls on somebody, you get in a lot of trouble. Um, and as you, I hope you would elsewhere in the world as well. Um, so that's winter is mainly taken up with deer and trees. That's usually what we end up doing most most days. Um, um, the herd is the deer herds also surveyed throughout the year. We do daily checks on them to make sure everybody's healthy and happy and living their best life, galloping around a park. Um, so that's lovely. Um, in spring, we go on to planting. So we do a lot of tree planting. Uh, this year, we're going to plant, uh, well, oh, not just this year, because it's going to take a long time. But I think we're going to plant 40,000 trees on one of our estate uh, areas um, to create a new woodland. Um, Obviously, it's the first steps of that is planting saplings, which are about that big. It's going to take hundreds of years for it to become a woodland. But that's something like I in 100 years, they I'll be on the record that I planted that woodland and it's starting to look like a woodland now. So that's nice. That's a bit of legacy um, site heritage that I'll leave behind. Um, uh, what else? In the summer, it's a lot of uh, control of pest species such as thistles. They tend to take over a parkland if you don't control them we use very specific chemicals to do that because we don't want to damage anything else uh we so the everything we do is focused on conserving the heritage and the biology of our estate and it's different to any other estate in the uk every single place is unique so you have to be really careful about how you do it that's all managed through a lot of government schemes everything we do is has, has to be compliant with uh the law and environmental practices so we have ecologists we have environmental scientists that come and help us none of it no decision we do is made on a whim it's all carefully planned out we have a 50-year management plan of our estate in parkland which is about that thick and it's a folder uh, i'm yet to re finish reading it um i've been in most 10 months now and i've i try and read a little bit every day um so yeah, I think if I was to sum it up in a sentence, it's practical estate management, but that's an umbrella term under which a thousand different um, aspects uh, occur. And then under them, there's another thousand and under them, there's another thousand. So um, if you're really in sort of practical work, then become a ranger because it's great. Um, if you don't like getting your hands dirty, I suggest you take a different route. <laughs> Um, for me, uh, journalism, uh, it's basically depending on the, uh, first of all, the media, whether you're a written or a, a broadcast or a digital, uh, like the website. Uh, and you, my, my, my history is I, I work usually with daily newspaper. So I have deadlines every day. So basically, as a journalist, what you wanted to do is you try to find stories uh, by interviewing sources like um, the government officials, like uh, the NGOs, the civil societies, or the lawmakers, or any potential sources, like the, pro probably people on the, uh, on the grassroots that come to you with an issue, hey, I have this kind of stories, probably interested in you. Uh, that's kind of like uh, the journalists have to pick it up and make sure that, you know, it's kind of like uh, timely, uh, have a very news value on it, and it can impact a lot of people sort of uh, like that. So that's a day-to-day -day basis for a journalist. So basically, they have to go out and find the stories, uh, find the footage if you're a broadcast, and, and then try to uh, uh, do the uh, usual 5W, 1H, uh, what, who, when, what, where, how 
something and uh, make it an article or make it a, 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 a footage uh, into a publication. Um, you have you you also have in-depth or investigation or feature. That's also depend, but actually every journalist has a deadline, so you can't uh, move away from that deadlines. And also, uh, the journalists also have to kind of like consider the time length. If you're just doing breaking news, just like 300, 400 words is enough, like you have oil spill, then you can have like uh, um, interview with the people involved with it that we don't have to do a lot of background on it. But if you wanted to do in-depth, you have to interview a lot of people uh, to complete the articles. Uh, that's what the journalists usually do. Uh, but we also have to do our research. We have to, to do, we have to read, we have to watch, uh, we have to watch uh, the news at the moment, uh, with the news at that moment. So you don't really actually go blank when you asking questions. Um, also the second one, journalists also uh, need to pay attention to the press releases. Usually we have, or we get press releases. For instance, the latest one from IPCC report that was, that was being released. So you have to kind of like trying to learn about it, learn the jargon, and then trying to make sure that you can capture what you wanted to uh, get for your articles. Uh, that's for journalists, but that's actually for the environment uh, uh, sector, for environmental journalists. For my day-to-day, -day, actually, I'm currently working as an editor. So uh, and as, as an editor, I'm, I don't really need to go to the field or to interview people, although I, I, I do need to do that sometimes. But my work today is uh, coordinating with the journalists in the field. I kind of like give them commissioned uh, uh, stories for them. So I look, uh, I research on stories, for instance, uh, that's coming from in Indonesia regarding uh, illegal trafficking, for instance, of tigers. And then I wanted to have that stories being written. I can coordinate or commission journalists in the field for that. That's the first one. Or I can receive pitches from the, the journalists on the field. So for, for instance, there's an issue about a coal power plant in the Philippines, and then they wanted to make a stories in that, and they kind of give me the, the, the pitch to me. And then we coordinate, we discuss. I give them outlines. I give them deadlines. And uh, I also give them, like, also talk to them about the potential sources that could actually get into the articles. And also the length of the stories. That's the coordination with the um journalists after I received their stories I did the first reading and then trying to make sure that the contents is um, in line with the outlines that have been given the structure and also the, the the data the facts the sources the names of the sources the official uh the official names and the places make sure that the accuracy is the accuracy is there uh, making sure that everything is put in place. And also uh, we have a policy of gender balance. So the sources should be like female, uh, male, uh, every, uh, everyone in, in different backgrounds have to be included there. So there's not just in one-sided uh, stories or article like that. After the editing side, and then I also do the translation also for my works uh, at the moment. So because in Indonesia, uh, the my my current work is for English publication, and the Indonesian sometimes don't really speak, uh, doesn't really write in English, so I kind of have to do the translation. So that's kind of like my day to day, um, uh, day to day look like for uh, my job. Wow, the variety there. I guess also the people that you're coming into contact with as well, with whom you're working with, uh, also touched on a few different roles there. But obviously, we've spoken about research, we've spoken about uh, rural ma management, and we've also spoken about how you can actually reflect all of that through media as well. Um, so there's just a huge, broad environment here to get involved with. And I think that's what's really great about all of the discussions that we were just talking about there was there's a real strand of equality, not only in the work that you're doing, but also the people that are in the industry as well, which is fantastic. Um, we've got a question that's coming on the Q&A and I was about to ask, as I always love giving this space for you guys to kind of clear up any misconceptions that you feel uh, within the industry. Obviously, this person has said, I love working with wildlife. 
but I've always found sciences in applications for wildlife and conservation studies and work placements. How can I still be considered when I'm not confident with science? This is quite interesting because I also felt at school like I, I didn't know whether it was a scientific subject. What do you guys think about that? And do you feel like that's a slight misconception perhaps as well? I think I think it definitely depends on the job that you're applying for um, and, and what the conditions are. So I think it's a tough question for me to answer because I've been involved in sciences for many years. And so it's something that I don't necessarily consider as much or maybe I don't give the thought to as much but I have colleagues that may be in that similar position and so I think too when you're applying it also depends on how you really approach yourself and engage with that application right and so it can be that maybe it's not necessarily science heavy like we think of with chemistry labs or biostatistics or something like that because those are things that I'm also not that confident with either um but if you are able to really play to your strengths, and so let's say you're fantastic at working outside, you're great using your hands, or you're a person that is fantastic with data sheets or, or something like that. If you have skills that you know you do have, um, play to those because there may not always be this initial need for a lab technician who's great at chemistry. We may need people who are fantastic with managing data or communicating with other people and bringing folks together into the science realm. And so most places are a team effort. And so if you have certain skills that you know you bring to the table, advertise those and really work on, you know, playing to those and also understanding that if you feel like you're not as confident about something, that may be in many cases, a lot of mental doubt. In the science field, I think we compare to our colleagues a lot. And that's something that graduate students do all the time. And we think that we're not good enough, which is not the case. And we all bring unique things to the table. And I think if you understand what you bring to the table, which I'm sure is a lot of fantastic things, then um, utilize those. And, and you can work on the weaknesses here and there. And that's something that I've tried to bring into practice because I'm not great at statistics, but I have to use those things in my field. And so you can work on those, but definitely definitely know that you always bring value to whatever workplace you're trying to to apply for. Um, so hopefully that's that's a helpful answer. I'm so glad somebody asked this. Right. OK, mm -hmm. <laughs> I have never been very academic. Um, I'm not I was never that great in school. Um, obviously, I knew biology particularly was something that I thought oh, this is going to be quite important if I want to pursue a career in wildlife and conservation. Um, I worked really hard to improve at science. I had a fantastic teacher, which helps a lot. Um, obviously, I don't know your situation, but for me, she was excellent. She really supported me. Um, so what I, advice I give on the academic front is find that person that can support you. Um, if it's a tutor or a friend or anybody who can help you out, take it. Never be afraid to ask for help with it. Um, I will also say on the other side, being not very academic, like Sam said, if you find what you are really good at, it can be applied to almost anything in conservation. Transferable skills are really important, whether you're really good at communicating with people, passing on important messages. Um, camp like that's really important in the campaigning side of conservation. We're always going to need someone to bring that to the public eye, um, whether it's um practical work you're really good at you might be amazing at fencing awesome like that's really important in conservation you might be amazing at so many other things practical wise that are going to be important um again like sam said data input i'm rubbish at that but luckily i have someone in my work who's really good at it and really likes doing it so i let him crack on with it because i don't means i don't have to do it nobody's ever going to be really good at everything uh, anyone that tells you that is lying to you um <laughs> so play to your strengths um and again like i said before don't let anybody tell you you can't do it because you're not good at a certain thing there's always gonna be something you're good at that you can bring to the table that nobody else will be able to do as well as you you're always going to have something that can keep you going so don't give up and keep trying you'll get there in the end well, for me, uh, I'm actually very bad at science. <laughs> That's why I go into philosophy. <laughs> but uh, well, my experience with 
I'm just gonna say the process of of, of being a journalist because journalist doesn't necessarily mean that you are becoming an expert on one thing. Journalist has to know a lot of things, but they cannot be an expert on one thing. So that's kind of like one of our strength, but also one of our weaknesses. Probably that I can suggest is, uh, that has already been said by the other panelists, is just uh, ask a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Uh, that's what I do when I handle with scientists, because I also have to interview scientists, right? It, it, it's My knowledge is just one day away from uh, from those people with PhDs. So I just usually just trying to uh, browse their, um, you know, like the articles or their their findings or their research and then come up with the answers that you can um you you come up with the answers that you wanted to know i think that this may might work when the in the process of the learning process when you 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 do the research first 50 percent you do the research and then you, you ask on people whether it's the tutor or or science professor that you wanted to talk about or some acad academicians that that's interest uh, that have interest in the same field that you you wanted to do. Um, I also I work with academicians and they they kind of like really happy to kind of like convey or answer the question, especially if you wanted to learn in the specific uh, areas. Because based on my uh, ex uh, experience as a journalist, uh, wildlife and conservation is really like a very uh, small and close knit group. So they kind of like, they wanted to have more people to join them, more people to be interested in what they do. And then, you know, uh, bring more awareness and bring more education but also to bring people to work with them so that's at least that's what i found when i was like uh, interviewing with uh, scientists or academicians here from indonesia so uh basically just uh, uh i don't think that you need to be like perfect in science i think yeah uh, it's a learning process everybody learning here uh, as journalists are also learn uh but you also you, you you have to be really brave on on asking those questions what do you want to learn and uh you said you're not confident on that i think the first thing that you need to do is just face on uh face it face it your 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 confident issue by asking the questions that you wanted to know uh in order to reach your goal whatever it is that you wanted to to have or to apply in the future I think that's for me I don't know how that couldn't reassure you that maybe you don't need science after all. And I hope that's also cleared up a few misconceptions perhaps within the industry that you guys might have had questions about as well. Now, we've got so many more questions and sadly, we only have time for one more. Um, and I think it'd be great to have a takeaway for our audience today, something that they can um, take with them and kind of apply it to whatever point they are in their, whether they're in their studies or whether they're just coming out of school or perhaps they've graduated and they're wanting to go into their first role or something like that. What do you believe is something that you've been told perhaps by someone who's inspired you or maybe even just something that reassures yourself that you're in the right direction and that you're enjoying the flexibility and the freedoms of whatever wildlife and conservation has given you. Sam, would you like to kick us off? Absolutely. Um, I think the, the biggest thing is never stray away or never fear asking questions. There is nothing wrong with asking for help. There's nothing wrong uh, with reaching out to people because you're curious about what they do or how you can be better involved. Inquiring is not putting in an application for something. It's not putting yourself out there to be ridiculed. It's demonstrating that you have interest in something and that you care deeply about where you want to go and that you're curious. And don't ever let your curiosity come off as something where you feel as though you may be ignorant or you may not know enough. That's what being curious is all about, is understanding what is out there. Um, I'm going into my fifth and soon to be my sixth year of higher education, and there's still so much that I don't know, and there's still so much that I don't know about the world at large, um, and there's nothing wrong with asking questions and reaching out to people and trying to engage with more folks, and I think that's the best thing that you can do is ask questions 
and really incorporate collaboration into your daily effort. So many of these things is not a solo act. It's not a duet. It takes uh, an entire village in order to get things done in this industry and in order to try and make a better future. And so be collaborative, be curious and, and dare to, to go against the status quo, because that's the only thing that we can do in order to shake up the world and conserve our resources and do better is by being loud, trying to be game changers and trying to work together in order to make that happen. And so take away all of the self-doubt, put it, put it away as much as you can um, and, and, and do what's best for yourself to ask those questions and put yourself out there. Um, I think that's very important. And who knows where you'll go if you feel passionate about what you do, the, there is no limit to what you'll be able to accomplish. So I'd say as a takeaway, guys, like I said before, I'm going to say it again, third time lucky, never let anybody tell you you can't do something. Uh, like Sam said, ask the question. There will always be somebody willing to answer. Um, and remember, you guys are the future of this industry. If you want to do it, keep that passion alive and go out and do it. I mean, without you guys, our industry, us three, we we don't have, there's no future. And scarily, without you guys and us now working currently, the whole planet doesn't have a future. Wildlife conservation is crucial for the running of this planet. And I think it's very easy to forget that and get lost in the politics and other world issues. But the bottom line is without wildlife and the, the green and the blue planet, we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. So keep that passion alive because you guys are the future. You're you're gonna you're gonna help protect this amazing ball of rock in space. I mean, so keep doing that, ask questions and never forget that how important your passion is because it is incredibly important to everybody. For me, I think uh, my takeaway is that wildlife and conservation still needs all of you. Uh, it has been since 10 years ago when I started doing journalism and it's still going on right now. Even it is more critical at the moment that wildlife and conservation needs a lot of people, needs a lot of roles, a lot of people to engage in there, a lot of people to cooperate, to converse, to have a conversation, to debate and actually to survive, uh, to, to save the environment uh, through wildlife and conservation. So uh, for me, you, as a journalist, we need people to explain to us so we can explain to people, to public, what's going on with our wildlife, what's going on with our conservation. Why is there still illegal trafficking? Why are you still you know, poaching tigers? What is what is got to do with our health and everything? what is important about saving the forest so we need experts we need more experts to explain to us to help us so that we can write it out and spread it to the public so for uh, those of you who's, who's interested who have passion in, it, in this world i know it's going to be real it's not going to be easy i'm telling you it's not going to be easy uh i've 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 talk with countless of experts, academicians, PhD graduates even, they said it's, it's, it's not easy for them. There's a lot of things going on with the politics, even the budget and the fundings and how they kind of like manage all of that, navigate all of that, but they're still going strong in their position, in their, uh, you know, in their profession. What does it mean? That's mean that they love their, uh, their profession. They have passionate in that, and that's get keep them growing strong. And it's something really strong when you you you're entering into environment. I've seen a lot of environmental defenders got threatened, you know, got killed, but they're still going strong. I think I'm not really scaring you. I'm saying that uh, that passionate is something that could get you through if you still have doubts. I think that's kind of like what will give you that fuel to keep on going and, uh, and instead of having doubts. Uh, even though it's still kind of like in Indonesia itself, it's not really a popular study or it's not a popular uh, uh, you know, road or research, I, but it's still going strong because the demand is there. It's just like you, people just need to be encouraged more. We have to push more. Uh, you have to have like certain kind of like uh, determination on, on staying true to this path. 
But uh, like I said, uh, in my experience and my expertise as a journalist, uh, we still need wildlife and conservation expert academicians, PhD graduates, everyone to help tell us what is going on with this world, what is going on with these issues so that we can kind of like tell people and tell the public, this is what's happening. I think you should need to pay attention to these issues. And uh, hopefully that would touch a lot of people and public through our articles and uh, our publications. I think that's me. Thank you so much all for sharing all of your helpful insights today. Sam, Sasha and Fifi, I'm so, so grateful and I'm sure the audience are as well for all of your helpful insights into studying wildlife and conservation, having it as a role, being a researcher, writing about it. It's all such helpful advice, especially when you're perhaps trying to find out a bit more about the sector and what it really involves. We've obviously touched upon there, huge emphasis on community, coming together, teamwork, because this is a really important industry that all of us actually probably are going to need to be a part of in one way or another to protect and conserve the environment that is so you know dear to all of us to keep asking questions keep curious and making sure that we get our voice heard whatever those questions are whatever issues are raised how we are going to be incredible environmental environmental activists all together now also a big thank you to everyone that's tuned in today we are so grateful to you for choosing Millie and if you are watching this please do drop in the chat which country you've been listening from today obviously we are an in international enterprise so it's great to hear what countries you guys are listening in from and I think we can all agree that Sam, Sasha and Fifi have given us some hidden tips and tricks for life beyond school and university or whatever stage you're at and our panellists have all really kindly given their LinkedIn's or emails to contact them if you do have any further questions but I'll leave you to have a wonderful rest of your Saturday on whatever time zone you're on thank you so much for joining and it's a pleasure to meet all three of you today thank you and I'll see you all soon <laughs>